Yes, most of most of these folks are my Activate students. So welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Well, uh, looking looking forward to our call today. Uh, we do this call the first and third Fridays of each month. And uh, for years, it was known as Rick's Free Friday Coaching Call. And the reason why, just for some context, for those of you that may be jumping on the call for the first time, is that during his 43 years selling real estate, uh, he had a passion for speaking, teaching, and coaching. And as he traveled around and did that, he never met a stranger and he would always give out his phone number and say, if you need anything ever, I need anything, you call me. And, you know, people did. And more and more over the years, and there was one Rick. So enable to uh, as a way to be able to continue to serve and help people, he created a one-to-many conversation by setting up this call. And these calls were always two parts. They're, you know, in part about mindset and in part uh, about skill set. So there's, it's company agnostic, meaning we're not talking about real estate companies here. Uh, we're not selling you anything. We're really here to offer value in the way of education and information. And as these calls have evolved, we're doing that through interviews of people that are leaders of leaders in business, in life, and in the industry. And so I'm really excited for the person that we have on today's call. We'll get to know her a little bit because I'm going to ask her a little bit about her story as we get started. Uh, but to, just to give you some context, uh, she and Rick have been friends for many, 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 many years. She's been in real estate for 22 years. Uh, she's been a broker for several of those years. She has a two-page bio that if anyone wants the specifics on, I'm happy to send you. I mean, here's a couple of the highlights. Um, she has uh, she sat on the National Corporate Board of Governors for NAREP, Chair and Vice Chair of CCA, our Diverse Diversity Committee in Contra Costa County, uh, Real Estate Board. She's been an active member of California, California Association of Mortgage Brokers, ARIA, uh, I mean, NAR, it goes on and on and on. So she is a leader of leaders in the industry. And uh, while that's all of her professional information, she is a mom, a wife, an incredible human being and friend, faith-based woman that was a very near and dear friend of Rick. And so Jay Molly's, I'm super excited to welcome you to our call today. And thank you so much for being willing here to share today your heart your passion, your enthusiasm, and what I'm sure will be incredible information for everybody on today's call. Thank you, Casey. You are welcome. So to kick us off, for people that, you know, that don't really know you, that are just getting to meet you for the first time, uh, what is it that you would say that people that know you best would say about you or that you would like to share in the context of your story and what brings you to this conversation today? Well, um, I think that my word is is connector. Um, an incredible connector in anywhere community is one of the reasons why I think Rick and I uh, gravitated to each other from the very first moment. Um, we, it's like everything that I that I know that I do, it's it's open to everybody to get a hold of. To I am an open book with um, my family, with my business, with everything. I think there's a space for anybody and everybody to learn. Um, and the more that I share who I get to be today, I think the more impactful I am in affecting positive other leaders. Um, and to me, that's, and it doesn't matter what language you speak, what is your cultural background is the reason why I, I'm very passionate about the topic that we're going to be speaking about today, because, um, at the, at the bottom line or at the end of the day, we're all humans and we really connect basically the same way. It doesn't matter how we look like or what our backgrounds are. So, um, so yeah, I think my word is connector. I love that. I love that. And uh, I did not mention you are president and real estate broker for La Rosa Realty in California and the broker and managing member of La Rosa Realty in Texas, where you reside uh, currently. And so, well, I always think of you as a Bay Area native and being here, I know that you didn't always live in the Bay Area and you've made your way around the planet, so to speak. Uh, but I love that because when I think about you, I think about being a global citizen and your word being connector and connection. Uh, regardless of where you go, I know that you've never met a stranger and you have ways of bringing value to people in their lives and their businesses to create the success and impact that you're creating today. So uh, I think we're ready to jump in. Where would you like to take us in this conversation? Perfect. So before I actually launch us in, in my context today, I wanted to make everybody aware of this call. I'm, I'm sure that if you're in the industry, you're aware that 
um, April is the actual uh, month of our housing and diversity in our industry, right? And the reason why I want to bring this to the table today is because I, even though, as uh, Casey mentioned, my bio mentions that I've been involved with uh, different um, creations or foundations of diversity committees in the California uh, real estate market, I was also uh, at the seating uh, of diversity committee at NAR at some point. Um, I do have a conflict with how we are approaching diversity at an industry as a whole. And, and let me explain to you a little bit about what that means to me and my experience as a professional. Um, right now, you know, when we think about diversity, unfortunately, because there's this negative connotation to a point behind it, everybody gets to, oh, here we go again. You, if you are in a room and you mention the word diversity or equality, those two words have been pounded and overused in my experience to the wrong point so much that people are immediately they hear that they're like, I don't, you know, get out of here. I don't want to even want to have a conversation about that. Right. Because we don't want to get into, oh, this word can be offensive or this gesture can be offensive or so on. So um, my my uh, position in this matter all has always been is like if you want to discuss diversity, especially in the business uh, set. We get to talk about culture. We get to educate people about what are their back, what's the background, where they're coming from, how they approach, you know, decision making in in their lives, how they approach business, and how to get to make decisions based on that. And um, and I think there's a gap between what that education piece of culture means and how our industry is approaching diversity, and we need to bridge that. Um, and um, I wanted just to bring this to the table to kind of like get you guys thinking. Maybe you identify with this opinion or not, but um, it's a it's a conversation that gets to happen because let's face it, right? U.S. is the location where every culture wants to go in and thrive and create and and deliver something better um, for them and their families, right? So um, I want to kind of like ask all around uh, if I ask you how many of you can share. Um, what are the biggest cities do you think that is most diverse, meaning there's half the, the majority of the population of multiple cultures? Anybody want to chime in? Anybody wants to say something? Seattle. Huge. Okay. Who else has an opinion on that? I think Los Angeles is very diverse. That's just my opinion. Okay. Who else? A lot of people here are from California in this call. Yeah, no. So I'm yes. going to go ahead. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and share with you based on data share as of 2023. These are basically the top 10 um, cities that when it comes to uh, population and culture representation is are considered the most diverse. So if you live, of course, in New York, you're there. Um, if the city of Oakland, California is your city, it's there in the top. Of course, if you are in either Dallas market or Houston, Texas, those are also considered uh, main cities for multicultural. If you are in Florida, Tampa and Orlando are uh, on the top 10. Um, also Arlington, Texas, I have to mention that are there. Sacramento, Los Angeles, Lo Long Beach specifically when it comes to Southern California. Vallejo in Northern California is one of the most diverse markets right now. Um, Chicago as the city. And we have Kent and Federal Way in Washington as part of that list of the 10, which I don't even know where the city is. Live, I live right on the border of Federal Way. There you go. There you I go. did that, not me, know that. that. Was, yeah, that to me, that was a new name. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. So I'm glad to have you here, Robin, because um, I would love to hear from you about your market when it comes to, to diversity and, and cultural representation. So um, with that said, I'm going to go, I have a little agenda about what we're going to be discussing. Um, of course, I'm going to be sharing with all of you here uh, my experience and the reasons why, um, you know, this conversation about culture, real estate and business is so important to me. Um, and I would love to hear your stories when it comes to um, your own personal experiences or business experiences when, when you are handling, um, you know, cultural connections in your markets, okay? Um, so let me see, there you go. So if you see the screen, um, this is basically the agenda. I do have what I call vocabulary because I want to provide to you some definitions of 
what I consider culture and connection is, and of course my own definition that I have created over the time, which have helped me not only connect better and, um, and be a better uh, business person to my community, but also have enrollment com uh, conversations. I'm not sure how many of you here um, recruit or enroll people. You know, we get to enroll basically in everything that we do daily. That's, that's basically what we do as humans. So um, it has helped me be a better recruiting enrollment for my own brokerage um, or, or for any organization that I'm representing at, that, at any particular time. And I hope it becomes of value for you as well. I'm gonna be sharing how and why this became important to, to me as a professional. Um, I'm gonna be sharing some uh, market information. Unfortunately, I don't have information for a lot of the markets because if not, I can have a whole day of presentation for you guys. So the reason why I want to share some data is because I want to give you, make you aware that this information is available for free. And if this and after this presentation, right, you guys see value and you want to create something for yourself and for your business, where do you get that information? I'm going to go ahead and share with you how and where, right? Um, and then, of course, we're going to talk about fun facts about culture, my experience and things that I know about um, certain demographics. Um, I want to um, provide you the or empower you to create an unapologetic business model around culture and embracing right who you get to be or who you are. Um, I'm going to share some resources and then, you know, uh, we go ahead and discuss any questions that you might have or any tips or again, more stories. I love stories. I don't know about you, but I'm just like our beloved Rick. I am a story girl. So um, the definition of culture. Um, the definition of your culture, what is culture, familia? Culture is a concept that encompasses the social behavior, institutions, and norms found in human societies, as well as the knowledgeable beliefs, arts, laws, customs, capabilities, and habits of the individuals in these groups. Culture is often originated from an attribute to a specific region or location. See that there's no mention about race, color, gender, or any of that. It's all about belief system, okay? Definition of connection. Definition of connection, uh, what is connection? Connection is when two things are put together. This can either be a real connection, like a chain linking uh, two objects, or you can use the word in a figurative way uh, for connection, okay? And then bringing those two words together, it's basically what I have for my own little term of what cultural connection means to myself. Um, my definition of cultural connection. So my definition of cultural connection is a reciprocal non-coercive <laughs> between two or more cultures where human beings express truth, build trust, and find empathy to serve each other's needs. The creation and collaboration of learn and share values, beliefs, and behaviors in a community of interacting people. Anybody has any opinion on that or anything that they would like to share? Okay. So how and why this subject matter became so important to me as a professional. I've been um, a real estate broker technically for the same amount that I've been doing business. Um, uh, back in 2008, when I launched my career in real estate in the state of California, if you had a bachelor's degree in business, you can go ahead directly and apply for your broker license. And that's exactly what I did. Not necessarily having any experience about it, but the opportunity was there and I just became a broker. <laughs> So um, as of today, just so you know, um, I get to sleep. I've been sleeping with Cultural Connection for 22 years. Uh, my husband, even though he is from California, uh, born and raised, his family is uh, Danish, uh, Irish, and Swedish. And they were very, very protective of their culture. Um, and when I married my husband, one of the first things that got delivered to myself was the family cookbook, which has everything and the whole history about the family and also all the, the favorite recipes from grandpa all the way down to the newest generation, which is a beautiful book. And I use that all the time. Um, also, my family, the last name of my husband is Rasmussen, and they were um, one of the uh, uh, first families in the Dublin area of Northern California. Um, they actually, um, it, there's a story that the great grandpa Rasmussen 
was actually used to hang out with Murrieta, Joaquin Murrieta. If you know anything about um, the history of the Bay Area, Joaquin Murrieta was an outlaw, basically. And there's actually a vineyard in Livermore called Murrieta as well. And if you go there, you're going to see a little history of that. Um, but the joke around the family is this. Grandpa Rasmus said even though he has a history in the area, never really did much with it. There was no land left. There was nothing. There's just only a rock that belongs to the family in the city of Dublin. And, um, and our family has a participates in this historic uh, cemetery in the city of Oakland, uh, the city of Dublin, which is basically a uh, uh, historic protected uh, cemetery. And that's where all my husband's family uh, rest as of today. It's a beautiful place. Um, so this technical Danish slash Irish slash Swedish guy married who? The loud Puerto Rican. Me, myself, right? I am from Puerto Rico. Um, I got shipped from the island once I married my husband into California. And from there, we created a, 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 a house of 22 years there, um, fully emerged in two cultures. Um, and not only fully emerged in two cultures, when I married my husband, my husband had a 16-year-old um, back then, which now is an adult. And he himself married a Vietnamese lady. So right now we have all these cultures going on in the family. My beautiful grandkids are half Vietnamese, half American. And you can only imagine. It's the Brady Bunch. It's just absolutely loud and crazy and fantastic. And we are always learning um, from each other about how to connect and how to make our family better when it comes to relationship. Um, so one of the things that I always bring to the table to my husband is because, in, I don't know if you're aware, but in 2014, and there was this study done basically stating that by a professor in the uh, University of Berkeley stating that the perfect race is, guess what it is, is the Puerto Rican woman has the, apparently the perfect DNA as per a biology professor in the University of Berkeley. And I milk that every single day since I know that information. So it's horrible. My husband can never win an argument because guess what? I'm perfect, right? I am never and this is not me saying it, this is scientifically proof apparently that I am the perfect human out there. So fast forward or taking a step back before I moved myself here in the Calif into California, which now we're physically in Texas. So right now um, we have been in the Houston market for a year. I am also a broker in Houston myself, but before I married my husband, there were a few instances in uh, or, or actually one instance as a professional that basically launched my passion into, wow, you know, culture is something big, you know, being in relation with the multiple um, humans all across the, the board is the way to do life. Um, before I moved here, I was an Oracle consultant um, and Puerto Rico itself is the location, the physical location where Oracle hosts consultants from Latin America and Central America, from United States and from Europe. So if there's any project that has to do with uh, or need resources from Latin America and Puerto Rico, the hub was always was always our island. Um, when I got recruited, my first business meeting, um, even though you know everybody speaks Spanish, in Puerto Rico physically, two main languages are English and Spanish, but everything of course in the island happens in Spanish, um, or at least back then. Um, the, we are going to my first business meeting and, you know, here, the whole room is full of consultants from all over Latin America. Everybody's speaking Spanish and then suddenly whoop, the language turned into English and we are hosting our instructions, our business meetings, our projects, what gets to be handled. And I am like looking at everybody like, what, why are we speaking English? Right. What's going on? So we get our first assignment. Everything happens in English business meeting and boop. Everybody turns into Spanish mode and we continue our day with Spanish. So I was extremely curious about this. And I go to the human resources office and I said, I'm sorry, you know, I'm new. And I just wanted to understand what the reason why we're hosting our business meeting in English when there's no representation of the United States in the room, when there's nobody from Europe. And the lady from human resources explained this to me. She said, well, listen, um, we were starting to have challenges in delivering um, the, the projects because of tenses, meaning there are certain um, countries in, in Latin America that when you say later, later could be the next day or later could be an hour after or later could be just, you know, in five minutes, right? And when they were creating the project's workflow 
and given instructions, depends on what's receiving those instructions, they're starting to have issues with the timeline of those projects. And when they realized that the problem was not the performance, it was just literally the, um, uh, the connotation of time, right? The, oh my God, you know, everybody gets to be in sync when it comes to time-wise. They decided to avoid any more errors um, to get screened by, by the clients, of course, and they switch the business meetings for project into English. And that immediately stopped the challenge. So when she explained that to me, I was like, huh, how can it be? How can we all speak in Spanish, right? And then yet we have a communication challenge. So that was my first cultural aha moment. Then fast forward, I am married and I am here in, in the United States in California. I started in the industry as a lender and I am recruited in, with this lender um, to expand their business into the Hispanic market. I, I was there hired to recruit, to create policies in order for them to, you know, to create that leg of business. So when I am doing my thing, I created all the, the, the manuals, the workflow, everything. I start recruiting agents that speak Spanish in order for them to get uh, mortgage loans. Um, then I realized, wait a minute, the money is not in, in operations, the money is in sales. And that's when I decided to become a broker myself and go into the, the sales part of the business. Um, so when I start selling and when I start going out there to meet clients, guess what? I face a communication challenge because I said, okay, if I'm speaking Spanish until this day, my brain still operates in full Spanish mode. I translate everything. I don't think in English. I don't dream in English. I cannot listen to my husband speak to me, listen to music or the TV at the same time because I'm lost in translation. Not sure if this is going to change at any times, but that's technically how my brain operates. And if I dream about you, you are going to be speaking in Spanish to me in my dream. Nobody gets to speak to me in English in my dream. So with that said, here I am having business consultations with clients in Spanish and I can't connect with them. I can't educate them. You know, there's a gap, right? Why? Because in Puerto Rico, our business vocabulary is very American, right? We, all of our, the terms that we utilize when it comes to finances, right? Uh, or real estate industry is very similar to the way we do things in American in English. But when it comes to Latin America, Mexico, Central America, or any other countries, vocabulary is completely different. So I found myself not able to educate, right, to have those, those conversations with my clients because they didn't understand the words that I was using. And here I am getting myself a dictionary of Spanish and trying to match the words. So when I go and do the follow-up meetings, I was able to find the right terms to connect with them. Not only was I, that was an aha moment in terms of actually Spanish language, but then I realized for the first time in my life about the different styles or set of beliefs of certain cultures. So for example, we, every time I would meet with a Mexican family, right? If there was a male in the family, it was a very male driven decision making type of meeting. So I will be, you know, for example, I will be in a dining table with the family and here is husband cross arms with the face because I was a woman coming with some service to him and he needed to project himself in power in front of me like he is the one deciding what's gonna happen at that table. Often that not, to my surprise, wife would either be not in the room or it would be behind him standing um, when that conversation was happening. And this was 2008 and nine, and I'm like, what is going on here, right? And then I realized that even though the male is here sitting being all, you know, macho, guess what? The decision making itself came from whom? From that lady that was behind, because she was the one who actually made decisions when it comes to family and finances in their family. And that is something that happens a lot, even though when you go into business meetings, the physical right structure of that meeting might be completely different. So we get to be observant of roles and who definitely have the final say. Fast forward from lending, right? The 2008, everybody knows that that was the big recession market crash. My come, oh, go ahead, Casey. I see you have a question. 
It wasn't a question. It was just more of a notice. So yeah. everybody that's on this call is in the real estate industry and has developed their skills based on where they've learned their skills. But what you're talking about is an entire set of skills that's relational skills that are the foundation. It's really important to understand the foundation of those before even entering a conversation, knowing what you're walking into to be most effective with the person that you're sitting in front of. That's what I'm hearing you say. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And okay, um, absolutely. So then the other, you know, here we are moving forward from lending experience when it comes to culture. My first big um, cultural experience when I launched myself into full real estate, um, I purchased a franchise called Casa Latino. He cannot get any more Spanish than that, which means, you know, Hispanic home, right? Casa home, <laughs> Latino, Hispanic. And the franchise model uh, was created to be uh, intentional in the education and the um, uh, provided resources to pull up, right, our Hispanic Latino markets in the U.S. when it comes to home ownership. That was basically the, the, the story behind the brand. Um, and when I, when I started to brand myself in the city of Hayward, which the city of Hayward, if nobody knows where that is in, in uh, Northern California, is a very, very diverse, wonderful market to be in. And basically the city connects with every main highway. So you find every culture in that city, period. So here I am, right, branding myself into Casa Latino, and we're doing all kinds of marketing around that. In this very, very, very um, challenging market because everybody was losing their home. The, the Hispanic Latino market got really hit back then, right? And there was a lack of trust from our culture big time when it came to real estate, period. So all that is taking place. I am getting involved, um, what I call back then politics, meaning, you know, I, I came from lending. I didn't really have any experience as the realtor or a real estate broker. And I needed to put my name out there and connect, right? So I can leverage what was going on in the industry, right? Because if you were not in the right rooms, you weren't be able to get what? The assets that you needed when it comes to our real market um, or any connections with banks, period, because you were just in your own little island. So here I am playing politics with the local boards, with any organization that was thrown at me. I was full engaged at that level. Um, that's the reason why I come across with the opportunity to be a founder board member of the diversity committee in our local real estate board. And that, that decision making is what gets me into meeting our wonderful Rick Jihab. So I am one day, right, in a marketing meeting doing a presentation, we were hosting an event that we call it a taste of nation. And that event technically created the opportunity of inviting every real estate office in the area for a cultural potluck. And we had music of different um, countries and, and everybody was encouraged to bring one dish shareable and then encouraged to dress based on their culture, right, and this city, and um, they get to have one minute of explaining what was the dish, um, say something about the culture. And then, of course, it was a big networking event because everybody got to connect and learn. Oh, my God, this lady, just like me, is from such and such place. Right. And what happens when something when you identify people with the same background is facilitate right the business, it facilitate you engaging in conversations about, you know, offers or accepting or, or marketing and things like that. So here I am, the marketing meeting, doing my spiel, marketing this event that was coming. And um, and then um, after that, I go about my business and I'm preparing to leave. And here comes this gentleman right across the room. And he comes to me and said, um, good morning, lady. I, You and I, we get to have lunch together. Like that, like out of the blue. I don't know who he is. I don't know anything. And he goes, we get to have lunch together. And I look at this guy and I'm like, what is he thinking? I mean, is he, this is the lamest pickup line ever. What's going on here? And I turned around and I said to him, I said, oh, oh well, well, thank you. I said, but you know what? If you want me to go to lunch with you, just you have to know that I come with a husband, a baby, a dog, and a mortgage. And that was my response to his invitation for lunch. I'm never going to forget Rick's face. He just dropped like completely in shock like he's like oh my god this lady's thinking that I'm picking her up and he's like ma'am I am so sorry I apologize there's no intention of anything other than I get to know you I said 
He's like, I've been in the industry for so many years. And this is the first time that I've been in a room that this type of conversation and dialogue is happening. And I, I have to, I have to know you. I have to understand more about where you're coming from and what is your vision of this subject matter. So when he said that, I'm like, okay, I'm going to back off, go my, my guard down a little bit. And I'm going to have, you know, um, lunch with this dude. So we engaged in a wonderful lunch. And from that point, of course, we became, we became the best of friends. That was 15 years ago. He ended up being the same age as my husband. Back then he was dating Casey, which we are the same age. They both love Oakland A's. They love Raiders. I mean, it was a checklist of things in common was incredible. And we were hooked, right? He not only became the dearest of friends to me, to my family, to my husband. But, you know, we did business together. He was under my brokerage for a point. I mean, it was just the works, right? So him having this conversation with this icon on the industry, because that's when I learned of how much experience this guy had and how well connected he was, continue making my, you know, it's kind of like provide clarity in my path of like, this is where I need to be. As a professional, I get to stand my ground in this subject matter because this speaks, this is, this is so easy. This is part of my skin. This is part of how I breathe. This is part of everything that I get to do, right? I do it at home. I do it at business. The simple as that is just flows. And, um, and his conversation and his almost acknowledgement or, or um, had, I don't want to say approval, but it was like, I was his aha moment. And he was he, the confirmation that I needed to stay in this path. The other experience with the aha moment moving forward was my first transaction as a real estate sales. Here I am, I am doing everything that I can think of qualifying my first Chinese client. Um, this client was a single man and perfectly, you know, with the best structure when it comes to finances, barely spoke any English. And, um, and I know, I knew strategically that I needed to find certain type of homes, right? Try to follow every rule of feng shui I can think of and anything that I knew when it comes to the actual asset that I get to deliver because of the way their culture works. But what I was not really understanding or doing is that I was not able to connect with him as a client. So here I was showing him houses where 30 days in, I was broke as crazy because it wasn't the recession. I needed to make some money. And I'm not able to put this client into a contract because we were not in sync. I wasn't really understanding how or what was his motivation for decision making, if he was the one who was making the decision or not, and what was the urgency or anything about him. I knew about what I needed to show because I had that down, you know, the type of asset that he get to see, but I didn't really know how to pair both of them, right? So 30 days in the mix, I'm frustrated, broke, and I call one of my uh, members of the diversity group, which she was Chinese as well, and I said, hey, we need to have coffee. I'm frustrated. I need to ask you a few questions. This is not working. I need to close this deal. So we go out for coffee. We start having the conversation, and she's asking me all these questions. The checklist is yes, yes, yes. And then suddenly she said, wait a minute, is he married or is he single? And I'm like, oh, he's single. And he's like, do you know if he lives alone or he lives with family or, you know, what's going on with that structure? And I'm like, um, you know what? I think he mentioned at some point that he lives with his mom. And she's like, uh-huh. She's like, nothing is going to happen until you see mom in the car. And I'm like, what? What do you mean mom in the car? And he's like, this, if there's not a woman in the mix, like a wife in the mix, they, we are very matrical when it comes to decision making and mom is the, the one who gets to decide and gets to give him the approval about his decision making. And I'm like, are you kidding me? I say, yes, I say, so be patient. What you're explaining, the way you're handling everything is it, it is what you get to be doing. However, it's going to be up to him to find it and bring mom to it. I don't even remember how many, if it was a week or two weeks or what. But suddenly here I am a Sunday waiting for him, you know, in the office. And sure enough, I see that car and mom is in the car. When I see mom in the car, I almost had a panic attack in my office. I'm like, oh my God, this is it. I felt like I just won the lotto because I knew that that day, whatever inventory we had sparked his interest, probably sparked mom interest and they were ready to act on it. 
we go out, we go see the houses, and the second home, we are walking, you know, he always walked in front, mom always walked behind, there was so, so much silent in that meeting that you could drop a needle, there was nothing, because mom didn't speak any English, he barely spoke any English, and here I am, the loud Puerto Rican, just trying to make something happen and make everybody, you know, giry and happy, but there was just nothing. We walk, we walk, we walk. I remember the house had a courtyard. We go into the courtyard. There were some fruit trees around the courtyard. Mom turns around, sees, and mom turns to him, and mom's nod. Mom goes like this. And he looks at mom. He nods back to mom. He looks at me, and he said, let's write offer. That was all he said. I'm like, oh, we're writing the offer. And sure enough, we wrote the offer is the home until this day he still lives in that home so that was another big aha moment so what i wanted to um share with all of you here uh right now if you're taking a piece of information is that we get to learn a little bit about what is the uh, configuration of the demographics of our markets and we get to make those work on their advantage and our advantage okay I'm going to move, let me see. Here, I don't know if you see this, but this is an example of data that I want you guys to be aware that it's available. And again, I'm not gonna go into the big discussion, but I just wanted to let you guys know that this, is, this type of information is available for free and you can go as super specific at the, at the cities that you guys are at. Um, we, I'm just going to share at the end as part of the resources, who's going to be the main person that you might probably need to contact in your markets to get this. But this is information that you're going to be able to process and evaluate. So for example, the first um, graphic here is more, a little more general and it's giving you a projection. This data is based on 2023. So last year, and it's giving you based on total population information. It's dividing them by race here, right? And it's also not only that, it's actually allowing us to learn what is the median income for that population in our markets, which is very powerful because guess what? We get to understand more the purchasing power of our, um, our clients, right? Um, the other graphic that we have here goes a little more in depth into a category, like here it says top Asian group in 2023, and it's telling you what is the percentage of that population, in this case, it's San Francisco, San Francisco Oakland markets. So um, with this information, you are going to be able to create, um, uh, you know, a more intentional um business model for you. Meaning if you really think that what I'm saying speaks to you, if you really see value, like you, you really want to dive in. If you yourself, right. Um, have a very, uh, you know, culture in your family is active, is predominant. You, you, that's something that you carry with, with everything that, that you are in brief when it comes to your personal life, I am inviting you to take that into your business. Be authentic about it. Be completely free about having these conversations and um, and turning this into a business opportunity for you because it will really, really pay off. You create a niche, you work that niche, and you are going to be separating yourself from the rest of the realtors. Remember, we all have the same scripts. We all have the same uh, tools, the same uh, you know models that we follow. We all do the basically the same community events, right? Because they work, it's proven. But guess what? That client gets to decide to work either with you or with me based on what? Whether they like you or not, whether they feel that connection or not. And it's that simple. I don't care what you know, great whistles and blows you have to offer, what, you, what, what tricks you have in your bag. It is as simple as whether you're able to breach that gap of connection. And if you yourself go beyond the, oh yeah, this is the, the, you know, the stats of the market. And, um, you know, this is, uh, your, the loan building programs out there and you can qualify for this and that, and you actually go beyond that on your consultations and you really, really, uh, understand the needs, the wants, the whys that drive that client to make decisions. And for that matter, when you're recruiting, right, when you're enrolling for agents also in your, in your company, if you go into that particular conversation, 
you are separating yourself. You're honoring that other human and you're allowing that human to really express where they are in life. And you can find then where can you come of service and of value and bridge that gap. And that there's nothing more powerful than that in my experience. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and now and share anybody that has any feedback so far before I go into some fun facts of, of some culture here. I caught the, that you had um, been a part of a, a, a dinner or whatever it was with different kinds of um, recipes from different cultures and stuff. Mm -hmm. Back in the day when my kids were young, I was the PTA president at our school and we, and we have like the schools just up the street and it's very, very diverse, you know, a lot of Latino people and, and uh, so anyway, so we were trying to figure out what to do and we came up with that and any of the moms that, you know, might be participating with their school and stuff. It brought so many people together. We had these big tables just full of like Greek uh, grape leaves or, you know, just all of this magnificent food. And you should have seen the kids because they were just like all up, you know, look in and everything, the tabletops. And they were just all, but they all had like a little bit of something, you know, that looked yep. like, you know, in their you know, but they, but they did gravitate to the food of their own genre. That was <laughs> kind of interesting. So, but yeah, it's a, that's a great way in my head to start at the, the level of, of growth and, and exploration, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Yep. And I, I do it. Uh, I have done it um, because the last, what, 24 months, I've been kind of like in the move of between California and Texas, but the first time that I did this for as a kind of client appreciation thing in my office um, was in 2020, what was it, 22, 21, 21. And, um, and it was wonderful. And the feedback that I got from everybody was like, oh my, you know, it's so fun that you are asking me to come and showcase basically who I get to be with nothing better than food. I mean, I don't know about you, but I love food. And I think that's the easiest way if you want to break the ice in any situation is invite somebody to eat something. Um, unless, of course, you're there in a freaky weird diet. But food is always, usually 90% of the time will do the trick. And um, so it was just phenomenal. It wasn't, um, there, were, there were not a lot of my clients that respond because it was kind of like a late minute decision, but there's something that I'm going to revisit for sure for this coming year or perhaps 2025. But uh, but what I also did is I took that event and now in my company, uh, my brand, we have also a diversity committee and we created the Taste of Nation. And what we are doing with the Taste of Nation is actually in, we have a family gathering day and it's all up, it's almost like a field day where all the offices gets to compete with each other and you know interact with each other in a fun matter. And we, brought into the mix the taste of nation and what we have is that we have boots from the countries all over the world i mean we have about uh last year were 15 representation from all across from egypt all the way to every country in latin america because of course our main office or main brand is in florida so latin america is basically in florida right now <laughs> but but if we had all all those booths and everybody get to dress so it was we were they we were voting on booth meaning that we were voting on flair right how 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 they, um how they were dispo uh, displaying their culture customs if they were uh wearing any customs and then of course food and um drinks and we have had in two years in a row the most amazing blast because our agents get to also what connect, right? People are crossing over offices and they're like, oh my God, you are from where? And they're physically in Miami or Georgia or New York or whatever. And they are able to what? Expand their business that way as well. So very, um, very uh, easy, a non threatable way of creating a network event, super fun. And again, I love food. To me, it's a win-win no matter what. So I am going to go ahead now and share based on the, let me go back here to this group. Um, I'm, I took the chance of taking some notes on the three main groups that San Francisco and Oakland uh, are showing as the main representation for Asian diversity. 
which is Chinese, Filipino, and Indian in the area. And I'm just going to go ahead and read you some notes that I think are going to be fun for you to learn. So if when we're looking at um, the Filipino culture here, um, you know, the Filipinos, it, they're key in uh, kinship, which means, you know, everything is, um, they relate as with people like the same way they relate with family. And that is something extremely important for them. They're going to be on your face asking you a lot of personal questions. So if you're doing business with this culture, be open to, don't be shocked if they ask you about what size of shoe you wear, right? Because they're going to be going out there and treating you as if you were a member of their family. It's a culture that has hard time saying no, okay? So it's a non uh culture. They, they rather avoid the conversation than to actually enter into uh, a, a, a giving you a no as an answer. Um, they they make the decisions based on the family. So they're even though it's an individual decision, it's always going to be a consultation with with their family and the hierarchy be behind the family. So have that always available, you know, present in your mind. So if you are sitting, say, say having a bias consultation with a Filipino family, identify right who is the hierarchy or who's the decision making in the room. And even though you might be speaking with only one individual, allow the space for the collective to come together. Um, when it comes to actually make that decision, okay? Um, they are fairly punctual in business, but in social, you cannot be punctual. If you show up in any other social gatherings on time, you're being rude. So if you are invited to a party, make sure that you are showing up late, unless it's a wedding and the only one who can be late is the bride. Everybody else has to be on time for a wedding for the Filipinos. Um, what else do I have there for you? Um, they are, they like appointments in the mid mornings, mid afternoons and late afternoons. Um, they, even though it, they have a lot of influence of Spanish in their culture, they are very mellow when they speak to each other in business. They're not allowed, they're allowed at their party because you wanna have fun, go to a Filipino party. But when it comes to business interaction, you you know, my energy right now, it's intimidating for them. You have to tone it down and you have to have a soft voice when you speak to them when it's a business um, interaction. Um, if they give you a business card and they put the home phone number on them, you get to call. If you don't call them, even to acknowledge, again, to say thank you or whatever, you're being absolutely rude to them. Okay. So they, they get that personal when it comes to sharing information. Um, and of course, the best way to celebrate a business deal is to take them out for food. They love food and they love drinking. Um, shaking hands in public only with men and um, females and males are not supposed to shake hands uh, to each other in a public uh, setting. Um, if they want to, um, oh, that's a fun, they have a funny thing about their, the fingers. So of course, middle fingers, so like all the, basically the majority of the culture is something insulting, uh, but they are so weird about the way they handle hand gestures just to avoid a possible, you know, show of that finger that even the number two, this is how they will tell you number two is not like this. It's typically like this, which is something random, but it is. Um, they um, like to uh, be gifting flowers. So if you close a deal, you know, give flowers is something very welcoming for that culture. Um, they, if you are invited, like let's say you have a client and they close the deal and they invite you to their house warming, never bring alcohol to the party and never bring big amounts of food. Like if you want to honor them because you know that they like food, bring a small plate. Don't bring, oh, I'm going to go ahead and send them a whole tacada so they can feed the whole family. Because if you do that, you are insulting the host because you're telling the host that they are not able to provide for the guests, okay? So there's a little fine line there when it comes to you participating in the hosting of a party um, because you don't wanna be offensive in that matter. It's, they have to be the big guys when it comes to actually hosting parties um, and being entertainers. Um, and then if they give you extra food, because they were going to give you, I think Filipinos and any Latin American country will always, at the end of the party, will have a little doggy bag for you. You take that doggy bag home. 
if that doggy bag, you know, gets home and ends up in the trash can, who cares? You are not going to say no to that doggy bag because if you do, you're being completely offensive to that family. So Filipino party here, take that home. You say, yes, thank you. You take it home and handle it afterward. But please don't be rude about it. I don't care if you're on a diet or not. Okay, any questions about that? Any comments? Any Anybody of you, anyone that has had any interactions with Filipino culture that want to share? That thing good? Okay, so I'm gonna move along to China. So China. Um, China is a very patient culture when it comes to business. Um, and if they see you um, or they feel that you are either pressuring or antsy, they will use that against you in negotiation, meaning they're masters of getting a sense of anxiety or business pressure to turn it around and get it and use it to the advantage. So when you are interacting with Chinese people, you always want to show up like, I'm cool. It's all cool. You want to close it or not? It's all fine and dandy. Oh, another thing about Filipinos is that even though they say yes to you verbally, if they don't put it in writing, they're not going to stick with the word. Okay. So in business, you want to make sure that you get it in writing whatever it is that you have them sign something about it because yeah, remember they have an issue saying no. So they typically, yes, 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 yes. And then nothing really happens unless you have it in writing. So keep that in mind with Filipino. Okay. Moving along again with China. Um, it's a very big hierarchy society. You know, they all honor their elders. Um, so if you're in a room, where there's grandma or grandpa, you get to completely be and show respectful for them being there. Meaning if it's a business setting or if you're entering a room and there's grandma, or grandpa or an elder for that matter, they get to enter first and they get to exit first. Okay. Um, if you, um, and even though they're, they're, it is a hierarchy society and it's also a matriarchal society, meaning that again, when it comes to decision making about family and finances, the women are the one who make those decisions. So always keep that in mind. So if you're discussing something and the wife is not there, uh, perhaps there's not going to be a final confirmation of anything or any decision will be made at that time because probably the husband has to go back and discuss with wife, even though she might not be physically in that in that meeting. So I'll, again, allow that space. If they say, you know what, I'll get back to you, they will get back to you. Don't think that they're brushing you off. It's just maybe they need to go ahead and have that conversation with the person that is missing on that table, okay? Um, and unless they're educated, you know, here in, in the U.S., in the Western culture, they're, um, they're usually, the data process is, is very subjective and it's more derived from experience than from any education piece, Okay. Punctuality, of course, for business and social gatherings is a must in the Chinese culture, um, and they will negotiate you to death. So be ready to just go at it hard, and even if they sign that contract, they're going to still want to negotiate. So nothing wrong with that. Just be aware that that's going to be probably something that you're going to be experiencing. And let me tell you my personal experience with the first closing, um, and not this uh, gentleman that I share with you, but they would, this was actually a, um, my, I want to say it was like my third or my fifth client. And it happened to be another Asian man, but this was a family and everything happened. Everything moved smoothly. We're, we're ready. We're at escrow and notary crying and me, we're in the same room. And you know, here I am ah, in celebrating mode, right? Just cheering them that they're buying their first home and the client closed the document. And he looks at me and he said, okay, I want 35% of your commission. Like that. I got out of the blue, like, bam. And I'm like, huh? Like, what is going on? Notary looks at me, notary looks at him. And I'm like, um, well, let's have a conversation about that. So I removed the notary from the room and we are facing each other. And he's like, like nothing is happening. I want 35% of your commission. You're making too much money, he follows. And I'm like, okay, so how am I gonna address this? So what I did, and I think this has this was basically a human resources skill of mine because that's my background. So I took a piece of paper and I said, okay, fine, if we're talking about salary technically, right? Money earned. May I ask you, what's your rate per hour? And he took a little bit of back and what he shared, he gave me the rate per hour and I said, fine, thank you. And I 
took the rate per hour. And I start calculating per his hour, all the amount of time, time, you know, money that he, that I spent basically working for free until today, until that day, right? Commission wise. So we, I think we were together, I don't know, maybe 45 days or 60 days or whatever. I took his rate and I and went on and I said, starting from the very first consultation day to all the showings and to escrow, if I do this math correctly and you're welcome to check it, guess what? You owe me two grand. And the guy is like, and he takes my note and he looks at it and he looks at me and he looks at the, you know, the little uh, window opening of the office and he goes, you know, calls the notary. The notary comes in, he starts signing. There's no feedback. There's no verbal feedback. He just took the paper and he signs. I sign. He says, thank you to the notary. He gets up. He walks away. Then he comes back and he said, oh, by the way, thank you, Jim Morris. And I'm like, all right. There was no more conversation about money. I got paid. And two weeks after, I got a referral from him. I still don't really quite know what thought process happened here because he didn't share anything, right? It was just all action. And I'm like, and I, <laughs> I was like sweating. And like, is this, am I really going to be up to this? You know, giving 35% of my money to this guy? But no, uh, it worked like a charm and I stood my ground. So just keep that example in mind uh, when it comes to negotiating. Um, yeah. And go ahead, yeah. So and then, then, yeah, you know your value and how to communicate it. And because you know how to communicate your value, and share that with the client, they saw value that they hadn't previously seen, which I think is so relevant, uh, particularly because of what's going on in the market yes. today and where things are heading. I know we're getting close to the top of the hour. And okay. so, um, you know, in like, as we like put all of this together, there's been so many like nuggets, like beautiful golden nuggets that you've shared uh, and and relevant to our markets and where we're working and how we're working. And so how would you say like in, like to put it all together, how would you say we put it all together? So um, first of all, allow Grace to get your personal interactions when it comes to who you get to be as a human to flow into your business. Be authentic. Uh, one of the things that we see out there today, to me, my experience everywhere I go when it comes to the real estate market is that there, there's so many people try to copy and paste other styles of what type of agent I get to be. And I think that if you really own yourself, like own it to yourself that I'm here like this at home and this is how I'm going to flow into my business creation, you people are just going to be so much in they're going to identify with you so much and they're going to really respect the fact that you are being that open and authentic with either with everything with all your experiences that can be a value for them or a lesson for them and also a piece of education so again unapologetic own your background and culture and bring it and make it part of your business and before i get to go here i want you guys to take these notes with you because there's finally there's there's more information in our industry that can help you really uh, transform or create a leg of of business very niche when it comes to your culture if you do have uh, if you do have this this background uh, prevalent in your daily day life um, you know as, as as a human period so when it comes to actually um, uh, getting data available, you want to identify in your market from the title company, who's your market integration manager and your strategic uh, market salesperson, okay? And that's going to be the person that you're going to be having conversations with. And that's going to be the person that is going to be providing to you all this free data available at so many levels, okay? And then of course, Explore, NAR. NAR ha now has a global um, uh, platform that they have so many big resources that can help you. If you are big in designations, I just literally got my designation on uh, CIPS just because of, of my vision with where I want to take this to. Um, and it is so phenomenal and instrumental and impactful. I don't really care about designations, to be honest with you, but this one is like, whoa. Again, it's very specific when it comes to how do you have to handle business international and locally. And then the other thing is this book, people. This book is a Bible. It says, kiss, bow, or shake hands. And this is going to take you uh, to understand 
all kinds of strategies about how to interact with basically every culture out there. It's a, it's a big, thick book, but it's a really fun read. Um, so if you want to have it as a reference book to grow, to get yourself better, to find tune skills, it's a great resource. And then, of course, I always say, you know what? The better resources is our family. Sit down with your grandpa and grandparents and talk it out. See what, what brought them here and um, and how they they were able to achieve, right? And you will be surprised of how those experiences are going to teach you so much that you can utilize and use it for your advantage in your real estate business. And that's done. Well, this was an hour packed full of incredible content and information. And thank you so much for bringing all of your knowledge and experience and being willing to share it with us. And I know we, I saw some notes in the chat. People were loving loving what you shared and learning so much. And we have this that's recorded. So it will be housed in our library of the free Friday coaching calls for anybody that wants to go back and listen to it on replay. And I know a lot of people catch it on the recording if they're not able to make it live. So I appreciate you so much as a friend and as a colleague and as family, really, for so many years of relationship with Rick. I love you, lady. And thank you for Bye. who you are and your contribution. Thank and again, my information, my information is there. If you want to contact for any questions, I am open book. Hope to see you soon, guys. Thank you for the time. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.